Okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. First of all, uh, congratulations to all the operators uh, for just uh, outstanding results and very, very challenging cases. Tomorrow is the structural day, and Dr. Sharma wanted me to give a bit of a segue into a structural intervention. So I'm going to present a case of uh, bioprosthetic mitral valve dysfunction that we worked on a little while ago. Everything I'm talking about is off-label. Other than that, there are no uh, disclosures. So the 77-year-old uh, woman who 11 years previously, I guess 10 years previously, had uh, a 25-millimeter Hancock II bioprosthesis placed in the mitral position, came back in with recurrent COPD, recurrent pneumonitis, and was found to have severe bioprosthetic stenosis. Um, and our cardiac surgeons uh, felt that she was too high risk for redo surgery. So she was referred to, uh, uh, to us to take a look at for a percutaneous solution. Um, so here we can see on the three-dimensional transesophageal imaging, here's the bioprosthetic sewing ring. This is the left atrial view. It emulates the surgical view intraoperatively. And one can appreciate that the prosthetic leaflets are thickened and mostly immobile with a very small bioprosthetic opening. And the gradient is high, it's almost 20 millimeters at rest. So there's a variety of options that uh, can be thought about. Uh, we've already thought about surgery. The surgeon said that she's not a candidate for surgery. Balloon valvuloplasty can also be considered. It does not work well for bioprostheses. Uh, years ago, there was a wave of enthusiasm, but we, I think we ended up damaging more valves than we helped. So that is not a good idea. And so we took an innovative approach. Now, let me show you what's uh, going on here. So this is a, a, an REO view. There's a swan in place, transesophageal. Here is the Hancock II bioprosthesis. This circular radio-opaque marker marks the sewing ring. The three dots are at the tip of the strut. So this is a, a, a um, stented valve. Uh, you can see there's a pacemaker. And we have a wire, this is a Lunderquist wire coming up from the femoral vein transeptally, so it's transvenous, transeptal, and then looped into the left ventricle. And right here, some of you will recognize that's an Edwards sheath. So you're going to do this transfemoral. This is That's this, impressive. This is transfemoral, transvenous, and um, there's no apical stick. And so what we're doing here now, of course, is we're putting an Edwards Sapien valve into the Hancock II. And um, we'll how, look. How big was the Hancock? It's a 27 millimeter. Oh, it's nice and the, big. Yeah, and the ID, um, you know, as we measured it, was about 22 or so. So we felt a 23 millimeter Sapien would fit really nicely. Um, and this is what Dr. Kirstein brought up as a really important point. Before somebody starts to do these type of interventions, you really have to understand the construction of these valves and the measurements that you're making. So, and you need to understand the fluoroscopic appearance of them. So we take pains to actually get valves, uh, handle them, look at them, talk to our cardiac surgical colleagues, and we bench test various valves inside them. The 23 millimeter sapien we felt would fit really nicely in this valve. and. Um, when we first began doing this, we would do an apical puncture and exteriorize this to create an apical rail for stability. But with this particular wire and this technique, we no longer need to do that. The Lunderquist wire is a, an extraordinarily stiff wire, and we pre-shape it from the IVC to the left ventricle with a very slight anterior deflection. And you can see as, um, as it's going up, whoop, let me go to the next one. Here's the final result. What we try to do is to anchor it on the sewing ring. This might have been perhaps too ventricular. We, I really wanted it back a couple of millimeters more into the left atrium. But you can see there's a nice funnel shape here on the uh, outflow so that the high pressure in the left ventricle will, will tend to anchor and cork it into the valve. And on the LEO view, we can see there's a really nice circular symmetric expansion um, uh, on this valve. And the final gradient, if we have it here, I can sh show it to you. So here's the pre. The gradient was basically 19 or 20, and it fell to 7 at rest. And let me show you the leaflets. On two-dimensional imaging, you can see the leaflets of the sapia are nice and pliable. All three leaflets were opening. It is possible to get this, the leaflets of the sapien stuck, and uh, we, you, you can unstick them if necessary. But these were working fine right from the get-go. And so there's the pre, completely stuck, immobile, thickened bioprosthetic leaflets. 
and uh, post implantation of the sapien, really beautiful opening and just trivial regurgitation. This patient went home the next morning and uh, really did, has, has done extraordinarily well. So I present this as, uh, as an example of an innovative uh, approach to a very, very challenging subset of patients. Um, based on uh, some cases we've done, I'm convinced that this is going to be a, a, a really good option in our therapeutic armamentarium in the future for patients with advanced valve disease. And um, thank you for your attention. This is a um, terrific case, obviously. It's really special, um, especially that you did it uh, through the transfemoral approach, which is you know, the way we usually do this is transapical. But I guess it makes sense. The first TAVARs for aortic valve were done uh, with this approach, and uh, it turned to be very difficult and could be dangerous for the mitral valve, but in this case, it's a, it was a great approach. TAVAR is great because, TAVAR, I'm sorry, valve and valve is great because you get such a great seal yeah. and you don't have to worry about perivalvular yeah. leak. Um, so, uh, it's and, interesting, you still can get some perivalvular leak because that thickened tissue is still between the two valves. It's, it's typically inconsequential, but you still can get some. We've and, used both Melodies and Sapiens. The Sapien is nice because if you just put the system upside down, then when you flex it, it goes right to the mitral valve. But you need a very stiff wire in, into the LV with a slight the idea of the Lundequist and you say yeah. shape it. Yeah. And the two caveats I'm thinking of, it, we, uh, for the mitral it's less important, but for the aortic you really have to have a uh, big enough uh, opening. The valve uh, the, the, yeah. that you're fixing has to be big enough, 21 or greater. Yeah. And then there is an app on your phone. You have an app on the iPhone for the valve. Yeah, there is an app that Dr. Vinay Bopit from London has developed called Valve and Valve. So if you're interested in learning the intricacies of valve measurements and suggested valves for which valves, uh, you can look that up. It's called Valve and Valve on the App Store. We, we routinely use this thing. It's great. I mean, yeah. it tells you, you, put it, you have to look up the valve that's in place yeah. that you're trying to, re to repair or replace, and it uh, tells you, you know, what, what size uh, valve to replace it with, which is really good. And you can also see fluoroscopically what it looks like so you know where to implant exactly. it when really you're working. But the real problem we have is reimbursement for this. So we have several cases that we just can't do because um, there's no trial for mitral valve in valve at this point that I know of. Do you know what there, there's, there's no randomized trial. We've published a series. Others have published cases. Trial to, to get the patient in yeah, today. No, no. So it's you're just all doing it with approved valves. With approved valves, exactly. But my hospital won't let me do it yeah. because we'll get, they won't get reimbursed. You know, we have, we've struggled with this, but so far we've been lucky. We've had many, many discussions with our regional carrier, as you can imagine. And uh, so, but, but we need uh, bigger numbers, bigger case series that we can use to you know, convince the payers that this is worthwhile, as opposed to a third So do you, do, I mean, you, you don't have to tell me honestly, yeah. but you can lie to me if you want, yeah. but do you actually call, before you do the case, do you call we the get, carrier? We, we you, get, it's Medicare, you know, yeah, I mean, you get, call them and say, yeah. can I do this case? They'll give you pre-approval, but they can change their mind is the problem. So that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs>